Bibles go to Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8. And in Luke uh, chapter 8, we're on a new section that we started on Thursday night, which, uh, as I said, for those that uh, were here and also might have been online, uh, was in the Lord's sense of humor as we were talking about demons and demonism and demon possession, and there it was, Halloween night. And uh, so for all of you that were out there with pumpkins on your head, warning around worshiping the, uh, the devil and Satan, and all of them trick-or-treating that night, uh, basically I'm going to repeat the same message that I talked about on Thursday, if you didn't get it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I am going to review uh, some of the more important topics at the beginning and then get into some of the newer information uh, that I didn't have a chance to uh, touch upon on Thursday night. Because this is an important doctrine and subject, even though we don't think about uh, demonic possession in our day and age, and certainly as we read about it in the Gospels of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and see the types of demonic possession that were happening there and especially around the ministry of Jesus Christ. We don't think about that being in our lives each and every day, yet it, yet it is every day. And we have people that are around us that are demonically possessed, uh, not always acting crazy and out of their minds, but sometimes they are crazy and out of their minds and we see that. But at the same time, as we're going to note, we also uh, can see people who are operating as angels of light. In other words, as they disguise themselves in their various doctrines of demons and the various spiritism that they have, there's a lot of demonism that's around us each and every day. And as believers in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we cannot be indwelt by a demon. We cannot be possessed by a demon because God indwells us, and God is not going to uh, let a demon reside where he is residing inside your soul. But yet there are unbelievers around us that do have some demon possession from time to time. Uh, and maybe even on a consistent basis, but we all can be demonically influenced. Again, Satan in his cosmic system is alive and powerful within our uh, world today, as it has been since the day of uh, uh, Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden. Demons are out there, demons are working within the world, and demons are also trying to influence the believer away from their relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it comes in all kinds of forms and fashions, and that's what uh, we're going to talk about uh, this morning, the various types of forms and fashions that demonism can come into our lives that sometimes we think, oh, I can dabble in that, or oh, I can get involved in this, but yet when we do, we're opening ourselves up for uh, a demonic influence, certainly not demon possession as a believer, but if we're un unbelievers, they could potentially be possessed at that point in time. But the negative aspect of that is towards the believer and the influence that that could have over our lives. Rather than walking uh, in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are now walking in darkness as we should not be doing. So we see uh, this example, one example given to us, and we'll read that text first. It's a fairly long text, uh, and there's a lot going on here. But again, as I'm uh, talking about on Thursday and then tonight, introducing this topic of demon possession, uh, even though we've seen this already, ultimately talking about it in more detail at this point in time than we did before. So in verse 26, And they sailed to the, uh, the, to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he had come onto the land, he was met by a certain man from the city uh, who was possessed with demons. And again, remember there, it's plural, there's demons. There's more than one demon inside this individual, which again is also fascinating to me when I think about it and uh, 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 meditate on that for a period of time. But also, as I said on Thursday, remember the Gospel of Matthew uh, that parallels this along with Mark. Mark is very similar in the parallel to what we have in Luke. But in Matthew's uh, 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 discussion about this, there are actually two men in this scene that come to Jesus, and both of them were demon-possessed. But yet we see Jesus then talking to the one individual and a demon speaking on behalf inside of that individual for all the demons that were possessing that individual. And as I said, also, we talked about uh, uh, this briefly. I didn't go into detail on this back in Luke chapter 4. I was kind of saving it uh, for this time, but now we're getting into it. But the first miracle that Luke uh, tells our Lord performing was that of exercising a demon from somebody who was possessed by a demon. All right, so uh, let me just throw, throw the map up there, too, so you can see where this is. Again, this uh, Ger Gessa is the city there, and then there's a G Dad, God, uh, 
Gadara, okay, which is below that. But all of this region there that I've kind of got circled there, that was part of the, uh, the territory of Decapolis from the Roman Empire. But these individuals who were living in this area were known as the Gerasenes. So in that whole area. And it doesn't give us specifically a city here. And it says, which again in the Greek can mean a region or an which I think is a better translation than saying it's a country because it wasn't an autonomous country being under the Roman Empire. But anywhere on that east coast of the Sea of Galilee, kind of in the middle to the southern part, this scene could have taken place. And then, but, but basically that entire area is the Gerasene. There might be people and tribe and nation uh, that were called the Gerasenes that were living in but now it was under Roman Empire, as you know, and there was a Jewish puppet leader that was put in place over that. And it, uh, at one point, one of uh, uh, Herod the Great's sons had control of this area. Okay? So let's get back to the scriptures. In verse 28, In seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. And we're going to talk more about that on uh, Tuesday night of this coming week uh, and ultimately talking about where Jesus would be placing these individuals and uh, where some demons are now and where others are, you know, where some are not. But in verse 29, it says, For he had been commanding the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. This wasn't the first time this guy was possessed. That also tells us, as we're going to see, that demon possession isn't a once and for all situation. And it may not just be one time. The, the demons can come and go freely from possessing an individual soul. Again, the soul of the unbeliever. So again, had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under God. And yet he would burst his fetters and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for we are many, or, or for many demons had entered him. And they were entreating him not to command them to depart into the abyss. And that's one of the holding places inside of planet Earth called the abyss. That's a holding place for demons who have not only rebelled, who are called fallen angels against God, but have also done a secondary type of sin, breaking the commandments of God for the angels. And again, we don't have a list of what all those commandments are, but we do know that the angels who cohabitated with women during the time of Noah, ultimately those angels are locked away in this place as well. And then even worse is that during the tribulational time period, Satan is going to be given the abyss. He's going to open that up, and these demons are going to be loosed on the earth during the tribulational time period once again. And they're going to be steaming mad because they've been down boiling in hell for a long period of time, right? And uh, just think of the torment that's going to happen at the hand of these demons during the tribulational time period. So, again, a very uh, uh, a scary time that you would not want to be part of, and certainly we're not going to be part of that because we will be raptured. All right, so again, uh, many demons not entering the abyss is what he, they were asking, a begging. It says, now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons entreated him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. Notice that they used their own power to enter the swine. They did it on their own. You see, D Jesus didn't put them in the swine. They used their own power. That talks about the power that they have of pos possession, not only of humankind, but of animal kind as well. And many times when we see animal attacks, even in our day and age, who knows? It could be a demon that jumped into that animal and led them to attack a certain member of the human race. And we see that in scriptures as well uh, uh, that we'll talk about at another time. But in any case, the demons uh, made the choice and ultimately God allowed them. Jesus allowed them. And there we see the sovereignty and authority of Jesus Christ. All right, verse 33, And the demons came out from the man and entered the swine. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Okay, and the lake there is the Sea of Galilee, uh, Lake uh, Gennesaret, uh, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee. But basically that's what they entered into.
All right, now, in verse 34, it says, When the herdsmen uh, saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found a man from, uh, the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they became frightened. And again, that's in contrast to what we see in verse 27, which we're going to note again in just a minute. It says those, in verse 36, those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was possess- or demon-possessed had been made well. And all the people of the country or the region of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to depart from there, for they were gripped with great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him, that he might accompany him, but he sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for them. And again, this next week we'll get into that, uh, maybe Tuesday, maybe Thursday night, in regard to uh, why were the people saying, Jesus, get out of here? You know, they d- he did a great thing. He took a demon out of an individual. He healed him. He cured him uh, from that possession. And ultimately, they're saying, get away from us. Some of the reason of that is what I'm going to be showing with you in just a minute. It has to do with idolatry. And again, because idolatry is really the worship of demons, whether it be known or unknown to the individual. Well, they may think they have Zeus and Mercury and Athena and you know, Venus and all these other uh, uh, great uh, gods and goddesses that they are worshiping. But behind every false god and pagan religion and behind every idol, there is a demon. And there is a demon leading those people in that religion. So these individuals probably were freaked out in regard to their pagan religion and what was going on. And maybe doing something against their pagan religion that might bring you know, a bad omen on to them. So we'll talk more about that when we get there. But it all has to do with idolatry. And this individual who ultimately was demon-possessed, we don't have a name for this person, but he probably was an idol worshiper, and that opened him up to demon possession, as we have seen. All right, so uh, what does it mean to be demon-possessed? Basically, uh, the Greek words for that, having a demon, that's the phrase that uh, Luke uses, echo uh, daimonion, okay, almost sounding like demon, demon transliteration of this pretty much into the English from the Greek, but basically it's the invasion of one or more fallen angels. You see, this is a fallen angel. Some people try to name the demons as a third category of individuals. Some people try to make these demons as a category of the Nephilim. And who were the Nephilim? They were the offspring of the angels who cohabitated with women, and then they had various offspring. And again, the men of renown, the men of old, okay? And they had souls too. And guess what? They were killed at the time of Noah. Many people try to say, this is the Nephilim. They're the demons. They're the ones who don't have a body to possess. So therefore, they want to go into that. But that is not based on any truth in the word. It's speculation. And if you read the uh, uh, letters of Peter and Jude, you see some allusion to the Nephilim and the fallen angels at the time of the cohabitation of uh, uh, women at the time of Noah. And you see that those angels are said to be locked away. But the Bible says nothing about the soul of the Nephilim, the offspring. So people say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. And they go to extra biblical sources and say, well, there it is. Oh, you can't do that, okay? Big mistake when you try to do that, okay? You can use some reference if it's backed up in Scripture, but you can't use it as a source, so you can't go there. So uh, they try to come up with a disembodied type of spirit, and they're, oh, they're looking for a body to be in, and this, that, and the other thing. But guess what? As I'm going to show you during our communion supper, even Satan himself possesses an individual. So again, In the body form that Satan has is a body form that all the fallen angels had, maybe in a different wing formation or glowing formation as we understand uh, our angelic theology. But basically, just because it says they are disembodied and they want to be in a person or an animal does not say they aren't a soul and spirit body already. They absolutely are. Okay, And... 
for whatever reason. They like to be inside a, a member of the human race, to create havoc. And for whatever reason, they wanted to go into the swine, but probably because they thought they'd jump to something else or someone else. And again, if you had the choice to be thrown in hell or to be in the soul of a pig, which would you take? I'd take the pig. I'd take the pig. Okay? I'd do it. Okay? If that was my choice, okay, I would do it. So again, we can't get into all this, you know, extra theological concept because they want it to be in swine and think, oh, there's something about them. They're ghostly people and they don't have this and that. We can't get into that. No. Okay? If you have the choice between hell and a pig, you'd take the pig, right? They were saying, don't throw us in the abyss. You see, they knew the penalty and judgment that would be brought against them one day. They know that they're going to be thrown into the eternal lake of fire one day. And they also know if they break certain rules of God that he has given to the angels that is unwritten and unknown for us. But yet there seems to be some written and known law for the angels in regard to the angelic conflict and how they can and cannot operate. And we see in the other Gospels, it says, it's not our time. It's not our time. It's not our time. So again, they were looking for another choice. And because Jesus was exercising them from a human, they were probably not thinking he's going to let us go into another human. Let us go into the swine versus the abyss. So again, uh, again uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that this coming week and see more about this. But basically, again, it's the invasion of a fallen angel. These demons are fallen angels. They were part of the rebellion uh, of Satan and all the fallen angels. Again, remember, one-third of the angels rebelled against Satan, excuse me, rebelled against God and Jesus Christ in eternity past. And due to their rebellion, God judged them and created the lake of fire for their judgment to be. But yet they've appealed that judgment. And with that appeal, God said, OK, I'll grant your appeal and we'll have a trial. And that appeal trial will be called the human history, human history. And that's what we are part of, the appeal trial of Satan and the angelic conflict. And so all the demons we read about, all the fallen angels we read about, Satan himself, they are all angelic creatures that rebelled, again, the one-third that rebelled against God in eternity past. Some of them and most of them are still loose today. Some of them are locked away, as we say and understand from Scripture, in the abyss, as they are, uh, have broken that code that God had given to them. And the rest will ultimately be locked away in the eternal lake of fire at the end of, uh, again, at the great uh, uh, white throne judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And again, at the end of uh, the millennial reign. So, uh, uh, again, uh, that's a little brief on in, uh, a angelology as we study in our uh, uh, theology, but, uh, but seeing it from the scriptures. But yet, what I want to uh, give is some characteristics. And I showed you this on uh, Thursday, and I you know, worked so hard on this, I had to show you again. But this demon-possessed man had characteristics of being naked, not living in a house, but living in a graveyard, okay? And this was our good Halloween picture that I shared with you, okay? Ooh, look at the ghoulie and, 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 and ghastly things, okay? But basically, what we see in this description is not just characteristics of what happens to a demon-possessed person. We're seeing characteristics of what? The angelic conflict. And as I said on Thursday, to remind you, if you haven't heard that, or if you didn't see that, or he hear that message yet. Again, when somebody is naked, what does that first remind you of? Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden. And in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 you know, through 11, remember, after they had sinned, Jesus came to meet them in the garden. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Jesus said. And they finally kind of popped out from behind the tree. Oh, we were embarrassed. We didn't want to come to you. Why? Because we were naked. Well, who told you you were naked? Have you done something? Jesus knew what they did. God knew what they did. But he was, you know, inquiring and letting them kind of self-condemn. Okay? or really come to the knowledge of their own sin, and we've sinned. And now, because of sin being in the world, nakedness takes on a negative connotation. Again, in the garden, they were naked all the time. Positive connotation. Nothing wrong with that. But now, with sin, it takes on a negative connotation. So when we see the man being naked, we see what? Sin. And Adam's original sin. 
And remember, that original sin is passed down through the male and copulation from generation to generation. And every member of the human race, other than Jesus Christ that has been born since, has Adam's original sin. And we are spiritually dead. And that is the second part. Living in the tombs. Living what? In the graveyard with the dead. He's dwelling where all the dead people dwell. And so again, the angelic conflict of, is what's in view. Sin coming into the world and the results of sin. Nakedness, which really talks about the knowledge of sin and having sin. And what does that sin bring about? Spiritual death that then leads to physical death. And, and guess what? All the illnesses in between as well. All the infirmities. So again, this demon possession and the descriptions that we see, it's all giving us uh, examples of the angelic conflict that we're all a part of. And that Jesus Christ came to what? Heal. He came to die for our sins. That's why he went to the cross as we're going to celebrate in our communion. So that sin could be paid for and our nakedness would go away. Our sin would go away. And we wouldn't have to live I uh, with the dead people. We could live with the living for all of eternity. And so again, we see uh, the unbeliever who is demon possessed being naked and living in the tomb and the analogy that that talks about. But yet you as a believer, you're clothed with Jesus Christ. You have and you're clothed with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And with that clothing, the Holy Spirit who is indwelling you is building you into what? A great temple, a great dwelling place and a house for God to dwell in. And that's what we see in Galatians and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and also Ephesians chapter 2 as we uh, recently had studied. We are the building that God is building. We are the holy temple. We are the house of God. And again, it's not a physical building like it was the tabernacle for the people of Israel, but for the church, it's us, our bodies and our souls. And we are being built into a holy temple for God. And we will dwell with him in that temple forever and ever and ever. And so again, the opposite of being, uh, you know, a demon possessed, of being naked and living amongst the dead, is that you're clothed with Jesus Christ and you have eternal life. And that's what the picture our Lord is trying to give to the people that he was performing this miracle for and for us today as it is now recorded for us. That in Christ... We have eternal life. Yet if we enter into prolonged periods of sin and carnality, reversionism as we call it, again, as a believer, even though we cannot be possessed, we absolutely are going to be influenced. And again, as I said, uh, you know, this past week, uh, you know, with the TV and the Internet and the movies and magazines and the radio and all the messages that we're bombarded with from the prince of the power of the airwaves, those radio waves that are going through, giving us information, information, information. Who's the prince of the power of the air? Waves. Satan himself. All of that information is designed to influence you away from your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's why you need to pick up and put on the full armor of God, put the uh, problem-solving devices in your soul to defend from these things, and to have that word in your soul so that you can understand the temptations of Satan's cosmic system and say no to those things. And understand what leads to demonic possession in the lives of the unbeliever, but demonic influence in your life. And again, sometimes being demonically influenced is as bad, if not worse, than being demonically possessed. So again, don't think you have a free ticket and you're off, you know, you're, you're fine and dandy and your sin and the way you're living in sin. You're not. Demonic influence can be just as bad, if not worse, than what it does to you. Because sin leads to everything, sickness, illness, and ultimately death. And that can be in your life, too. So again, you know, let's not think I'm a believer. I don't have to, you know, uh, I don't have to defend myself from Satan and his attacks. Absolutely you do. Because demonic influence is powerful in your life, just as it is in the life of the unbeliever as well. And all demonic activity is the result of what? Our own free will. Again, it's our choice. For the unbeliever to open themselves up to demonic possession they get involved in all kinds of crazy things and bad things and evil things and sinful things. For the believer to be demonically influenced, the same goes for them. 
If we open ourselves up to, you know, you know uh, uh, get involved in certain things, think certain things, view certain things, we're opening ourselves up to what? Demonic influence. And the pain and suffering and difficulty that goes along with it. And as you know, the, um, the healing or the correction for somebody who is demonically possessed is what? Faith in Jesus Christ, to believe in Jesus Christ. And guess what? The healing or correction for the believer who is demonically influenced is what? Faith in Jesus Christ by the confession of sin, going back to the cross where sin was paid for, reminding yourself of that, knowing that your sins are forgiven and now moving forward and allowing the Spirit to fill your soul along with the Word of God. So, again, God has given us the corrective actions to take called faith in Jesus Christ. But we also have to remind ourselves that that's a volitional responsibility that we have. And the other aspect of volitional responsibility is making bad decisions and getting involved in the things that cause possession or influence. And the Bible gives us a list. I went over these in detail. I just want to remind you of these things. I'm not going to go through all of that. But idolatry, certainly, getting involved in false god religion, and that can be inside, quote-unquote, the Christian church or outside. And again, there's a lot of idolatry inside certain religions and denominations of Christianity where they worship certain things that the Bible says they never should. Certainly the worship of Mary or any saint praying to them that is idolatry. And guess what? You're opening yourself up to influence and possession. And then we have drug addiction, including alcohol addiction. And if we turn to drugs or alcohol to solve our problems or take the edge off or ease us here and there, that's called sorcery in the Bible, English translation, which is really pharmakia, where we get the word pharmacy from. And we open ourselves up to drug, uh, when we have any kind of drug addiction or alcohol addiction, we're opening ourselves up to demonic influence and for the unbeliever, demonic possession. And again, that whole sorcery thing comes, again, you might think, oh, that's just witchcraft. Well, back in the ancient day, they would mix this potion with that potion. And they were mixing this drug with that drug to create a sensation or a hallucination. And they would basically create something that would cause somebody to be open to what? Suggestion or influence. That's what pharmakia is. And so as we dabble in drugs or alcohol, thinking, you know, we need these things within our lives, we are definitely demonically influenced. As a believer and as an unbeliever, could be possession as well. The phallic cult, basically, that went along with the idolatry, and, uh, but we could also say that's the worship of sex. And again, pornography and the things we see in our society today and regular TV and uh, Internet and all these things and how easy of access it is. The genesis of all of that is what? Demonism. And if we entertain ourselves with these things, we're definitely opening ourselves up to the influence and for the unbeliever possession, as Isaiah speaks. Now, unfortunately, and again, we may even see some uh, uh, you know, fringes of this within uh, the world today, but the phallic cult and sexual immorality was part of their idolatry back in the day, and even back in the time of Jesus, with the temple prostitutes where they could be you know, uh, men, women, uh, young or old, and the demon possession that would come into certain individuals that would be involved in these things would lead them to that kind of sexual immorality whether it be gay, lesbian, heterosexual, or pedophilical. I don't know if that's a word to say, but pedophiles, as you know, okay? Don't want to make light of it, but... Church of Corinth, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, definitely, pro yeah, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah okay, yep. Yeah. So, uh, again, the phallic cult, again, kind of has a dual aspect. It was part of the religious process back in the day, but it also could be extra outside the church or outside of religion. And then again, any kind of mental attitude sins that we have on a consistent basis. And then uh, the last one, which is also very prevalent in our day and age, is dabbling in the occult, going to a medium, going to a spiritist, uh, performing necromancy, trying to speak with the dead. And as we said, palm reading, tarot card reading, fortune telling, and we could even say the zodiac signs thinking that your day is going to be based on what your zodiac sign is today and the message that they give you in the newspaper. Am I going to have a good day or a bad day? I better go check my zodiac. 
That's demonic. And it's demonic influence and can lead to demonic possession for the unbeliever. And again, 1 Samuel 28 is a great story of Saul and his uh, dealings with necromancy that ultimately he also outlawed in his own country that he was the king of because it was outlawed according to the law of God. But yet he searched out when he freaked out and wasn't trusting in God. He sought out a medium as well. And up came the prophet Samuel from uh, Abraham's bosom in paradise inside the earth <laughs> to the witch of Endor's surprise in his too. Okay? <laughs> and then gave him an ominous message. You're going to be with me tomorrow. Not only you, but your sons too. <laughs> so he probably shouldn't have done that, right? But in any case, uh, again, when we dabble in these things, we think, oh, it's fun. Oh, it's just good, good natured. Oh, it doesn't mean anything. It can't hurt anything. Oh, yeah, be very careful. Be very careful. This stuff is real. And it's very subtle. And as we see in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19, it says, When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spirits who whisper in mute. And I love this verse. Should not a people consult their God? You know, everybody's going to run the, to the medium and the tarot card person and have the seance and try to get answers for this. Am I going to meet my right man? Uh, am I going to have a good life? Am I going to get this job? Am I going to get this? Let, me, let them tell me. Should not that person run to their God? Absolutely. That's the person you should be looking for these things because he knows. These people have no idea. Yes, yeah, Satan and his demonic forces can try to work to make certain things happen as predicted. But again, they got to work to make it happen. It doesn't always happen. God knows what's going to happen. And he will give you the guidance and protection and all that you need. And then as it says, should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Again, you're going you're to talk to a dead person? And especially the spiritually dead, fallen angels? Or are you going to consult the living, which is God himself? So then we also understand that demon influence is that infiltration of satanic thought into the soul of the uh, believer or the unbeliever. First Timothy uh, uh, four one speaks to that as well as Ephesians chapter four in verse seventeen, and uh, many times we see it also being the substitution of emotion over thought. And demonic influence in our life is when we let our emotions control us and lead us and uh, guide us rather than thought. Again, understanding the Word of God and applying it within our lives. Having good intellect and a good understanding of situations versus my feelings get hurt, so now I'm going to do this. Or I, you know, you know, uh, I, I want to feel good uh, uh, about myself, so I'm going to go out and do that. And again, many times people are turning to the occult, to drugs and alcohol and all these other aspects that uh, can cause demonic influence or possession because their emotions, they're not controlling their emotions and they're letting their emotions rule them. And we should never be in that position. We should let our thought rule us. We should let doctrine rule us. We should l allow, you know, the rationalism and the understanding of what the Word of God is all, uh, all about and cycle that through our soul. And then we'll come to know what I should and should be doing. And oh, by the way, you're not going to feel bad about yourself. You're going to have a good-natured feeling about yourself. You're going to have happiness. You're going to have joy. You're going to have confidence. You're going to go forward in the plan strong because you know your God is strong and stronger than anything that this world can throw at you, including demonic possession or influence. And it's stronger than your emotions. And God can lead you if you would just let Him lead. And you would turn to Him by learning His Word and then applying His Word is what we call faith. Demon possession in the present time is often unsuspected, as we've been talking about. Again, the good-natured, oh, the terracot person, the medium, the spiritist, what's the, the, the Loyola of, uh, 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 what, what, what's her, no, the, the uh, what's, her, what's her name? The one in New Jersey. Who's the one with the big fingernails? They're about this long, and she's the spiritist medium, okay? Uh, Loyola of, what's her name? Oh, you don't know? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Long Island Lolita, or what? I, I forget what her. No, that was the girl who killed somebody, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Medium, Long Island Medium. She's on TV. You know, there was a guy back that I've mentioned in the past. He was back more in the 90s, maybe early 2000s. But, you know, now you see these Long Island mediums or whatever, the, you know, whatever the case. But again, you know, we think, oh, it's good nature. It's just fun. It's not hurting it. No, it is. This is this is serious stuff. You may not think so, but it really is. But the fact is that the demons even disguise themselves as angels of light. And they come across as being good, but yet it's not. And it's a fault. It's a twisted uh, thought or twisted theology or twisted faith to lead you away from God in your relationship with him. Okay, yeah. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, well, okay. Yeah. She was shocked. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and again, you know, a lot of what these mediums and spiritists are doing, the tarot card reading and all of this, a lot of it's false, and there's a gimmick to, you know, make it all work. But they're opening themselves up, and, especially, and if they're an unbeliever, they're opening themselves up to possession. And they could truly be possessed by a demon that knows and sees you from a spirit world, okay? Not just from the physical realm. And they can do stuff or say stuff. And as, he's, as uh, John just said, again, they can u- ultimately know that you're a person of God or that you're not. So again, you know, some of it's real. A lot of it's fake, okay? But none of it's good. <laughs> none of it's good. And again, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And we're going to see that uh, in our communion because we're going to talk about Satan possessing who? Judas Iscariot. Right? And that came off as an angel of light. See, Judas thought he was doing a good thing. And he was acting as an angel of light. Even though he's, but, and, and he wasn't throwing Judas into a, you know, a rage, a fit. Judas didn't you know, go streaking down the street of Jerusalem, taking my clothes off. I'm d- possessed by Satan now. We're streaking. I'm supposed to get a laugh out of that. No, I don't think that's funny. Okay. And he wasn't hurting himself or doing anything like that. No. He went to turn Jesus in because he thought, oh, this would be a good thing. Judas th- was thinking at first, this would be a good thing because Jesus is going too far, okay? And I'm trying to protect him. So again, can disguise as angel of light. Again, further disguise their appearance as dominating spirits. Again, uh, but it says it, in the latter times, I, I could say we're in the latter times, don't you? Some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to what? Deceitful spirits. You know, you think about this, think about alcohol. Why do they call it the spirits? You ever think about that? They call it the spirits. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're very deceitful. Don't fool yourself. They're very deceitful. Yeah, it's called spirit. It's called spirit. Isn't that a coincidence? I don't think so. Okay? But in any case, paying attention to deceitful spirits and what? Doctrines of demons. The false doctrines that are out there in the world. So the Bible definitely warns us not to participate in any of these things in any form or fashion, getting involved in these things. Ultimately, you know, the scriptures and uh, showed you some of these, but some new ones uh, as well. In, in you know, in, in uh, the nation of Israel, God said, stone these people to death. If they're involved in this, get rid of them. Get them out of your society because it's going to have a negative effect. Again, we don't do that today. We're not so supposed to go out and just murder people like that, okay? But ultimately, because we're not under the law anymore, we're under grace. But basically, that talks about the severity of this. And we see God warning the people uh, and, and the nations over and over again. I'll give you a couple. It says, do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord, your God. You know, when you're seeking these things out, you're not seeking out God. Let's seek out our Lord, who is our God. Let's seek him out. But when we turn to the influences of Satan and his cosmic system, we're not seeking God. In Leviticus 26, it says, As for the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists, to play the harlot after them. And what does that mean, who play the harlot? You're cheating on God. Right? You're cheating on God, the adulteress. Uh, you know, prostitution is in view in that. You're cheating on God. Play the harlot after them. I will also let my face uh, uh, set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. 
So the characteristics of uh, demon possession, again, can be varied. Many different forms and fashions that they come in. And I'm going to give you a couple of these. Uh, I've, I've, I've gotten the notes. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but there's a couple I do want to point to because they are very serious in our day and age as well. And again, it can include anything from physical problems to mental problems and mental abnormalities. Now, in the Scripture, we see dumb blindness and convulsions. And again, we see all kinds of things. They can't see, they can't hear. Convulsions, almost like having an epileptic uh, reaction. Again, we see that described many times. We also see tendencies to self-destruction. And again, when uh, you know my kids were uh, teenagers, again I was you know more in tune to these things uh, back then than uh, today. Uh, but I'm sure uh, those of you who know and uh, anything about the school systems and stuff, and you know a lot of these kids were cutting themselves. You know, they're cutting themselves. Why are they doing that? Well, it could have been some demonic possession if not demonic influence and they're cutting themselves and they're hurting themselves in different ways and we see that in matthew and mark and also the gospel of luke they could be abnormally violent again many people who commit crimes okay or just have fits of rage they allow themselves to be open and next thing you know they're murdering somebody again they could have that potential they could inflict uh, suffering illnesses and deformities as you know as many of the illnesses that we talk about in the scriptures and Jesus healing them. Some of them are based on demonic possession. Others are not. Some, sometimes, you know, many times sickness is just sickness. The demonic possession can cause sicknesses and in, in, in paralysis and things like that into people. But, other t- uh, and, and, uh, but many times, sin by itself, which is called demonic sin within your life, on a consistent basis, can cause sicknesses and illnesses and disease and mental illness as well. So again, we see that demonic possession can cause these, but also uh, many times these things are just out there in society. uh, And they're not caused by demonic possession, but yet it's a possibility. Insanity. You know, we see a lot of diagnosis of, uh, you know, bipolar. We see a lot of diagnosis of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ADD or ADDH or whatever these things are in kids these days, okay? We see a lot of that. Yes, some of it just physiological, what's going on with the brain, it's happening. It's just kind of the things aren't all working the way they might normally want to work. But sometimes it can be demon possession as well and can be demonic influence. Also, the nakedness. I already used my streaking joke, so I won't use that again. Okay? I'm such a funny guy, all right? Nobody laughs. All right? Another one of grinding the teeth. Okay? The grinding and the gnashing of the teeth. And then we also see uh, living among the dead, as we've talked about with our individual. And then we see uh, uh, superhuman feats and strength. And sometimes that can come from demonic uh, possession as well. And then the last is what we've already talked about, the occult powers. Let me have you turn to Acts chapter 16. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. And again, going back to this demonic influence and, you know, people hurting themselves. And, you know, we we are seeing a rampant amount of, you know, suicide, especially amongst our young in our nation. And again... I'm not saying they were demon-possessed, but there's a lot of demonic influence out there. And when people don't have places to turn to, and we see it also in our military, and the men coming back from warfare, they've seen a lot of things that really mess up the head. Okay, And if you don't have the Word of God and Bible doctrine in the soul to offset those things, Satan is going to use that. Many times he leads these people to, uh, uh, unfortunately, kill themselves, which is a very sad thing. So again, we take these things real and we see a rampant amount of especially with drug overdose and things like that that's another form of killing ourselves from demonic influence or whatever the case and again it's a sad thing that we have to take serious and if we see people with these types of things in their lives that's people you should be witnessing to that's people you should be evangelizing Go to the people that are having mental issues within their life. And you see maybe physical issues within their life. Speak to them. Talk to them. Give them the strength of God and the word in their life. 
And even during the apostles in Acts chapter 16 and verse 16 through 18, it says, And it happened that as we were going out to the place, and again, Paul and his, uh, uh, his uh, a party, uh, again, they were going to look for a place of prayer. A certain slave girl having a spirit of divination met us. And that word divination in the Greek there is python, as we would pronounce it. But uh, in the Greek language, that was some uh, word they used for somebody that would be a ventriloquist or a soothsayer. Okay, So they would speak in different languages or speak on behalf of someone else. You know, a little dummy ventriloquist. It's really the guy behind it that's speaking, and they're just moving the mouth of the dummy. But it sounds like it's coming from the dummy. Well, the demon possessed person's the dummy and the one behind it is the demon that are speaking so again this python type of demon okay so she had a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling so again this would be a real thing but again working to make it happen by demons working with demons so following after paul in us she kept crying out saying these men are bond servants of the most high god who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Kind of what John talked about when he met a woman uh, on jury duty. Now verse 18, and she continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed. It's interesting. She was saying a good thing, wasn't she? These are the men of the Most High God, men of the Most High God. But she was doing it in such a way that it became a pain and very distracting. Plus, she was a woman of divination who again, had all kinds of false things going on and uh, 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 negative things happening as a result of her fortune telling. And basically, do you want that person to be saying, you know, this is Christ, this is Christ, this is Christ? But again, more importantly, it was just annoying, okay? And they weren't able to minister as they would because this woman was dogging them, as we would say, speaking this day after day after day. All right, so continue doing it for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. But when her master saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. And then again, you can see the rest of it. Uh, well, re read verse 20. It says, And when they had brought them to the chief magistrate, they said, These men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews. Oh, really? Were they throwing into confusion? <laughs> All they did was exercise a demon out of this woman who was really causing the confusion. So in any case, dabbling in the occult is something that can lead us to, again, demonic influence for the believer, but certainly possession uh, for the unbeliever. And then the other aspect of this is the healing aspect. Yes, Jesus Christ healed people legitimately, but many times to heal them, he legitimately would take the demon out of them. And as a result of taking the demon out, they would be healed. Well, guess what? Satan can counterfeit that very easily. He could have one of his demons enter into somebody, have some kind of illness or sickness or something going on, and then at the command of Satan have that person come out, especially when there's a fake healer out there that's trying to heal this person. In the name of Jesus, come out, you know, as they try to say, okay? And that demon comes out, and it may look like the person, and it looks like the person got healed, and the person might have gotten healed, but it wasn't by God. It was because of what Satan can do. So again, we see that in Matthew, uh, Thessalonians, and Revelation. Anything else? <laughs> right, right. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So, yeah. It's a good point when Moses was performing his... Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, yeah, what's in there. So, again, for those online, for when Moses was performing his miracles of the ten plagues of Israel, Pharaoh's magicians were counterfeiting all of that, okay? So they can do similar things that God is doing. God does it in a certain way where it's real and legitimate, but they can also counterfeit these things as well. So, again, they disguise themselves as angels of light sometimes, so many times you may not know whether this is truth or not. But when you have Bible doctrine in your soul, you're going to see the truth, you're going to see the lie, and you're going to be able to distinguish one from the other. So, again, uh, 
I won't go through this because, again, all illnesses aren't the result of demonic activity because the Scriptures tell us there's a difference. It says, you know, news about him was spreading in all of Syria. And they brought to him all who were ill, suffering, various diseases, pains, demoniacs, epileptic, paralytic, and also all of them were healed. So we see a difference between demoniacs, which is somebody who is demon-possessed and has some form of illness or uh, mental uh, disease as a result, but we see that separate from the other types of illnesses as well. So again, you, you can never judge per se whether this is from a demon or not in an individual, so be very careful about that. But as I said also, God will give us discernment so we'll see the truth from the lie. And the fact of the matter is Jesus Christ controls history. So should we be afraid of the demons? Should we be scared of them? Absolutely not. Greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. They are powerless to do anything over God. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, 4, God is more powerful and God is in you. So again, don't be afraid of, uh, certainly you'll never be demon possessed. You don't have to worry about that. And demonic influence? Again, you don't have to be worried or concerned about somebody who is in demonically influenced affecting you if you're going forward in the Word of God. Continue to learn and apply the Word of God, and all those things will be dealt with. God is greater. God is more powerful, and God is in you. And you have to remind yourself of that and not be afraid of the demons. And looking over your shoulder, oh, the demons are going to get me here. The demons are going to get me there. And then many people in Christianity get very paranoid about their spiritual life. Because they think a demon's going to jump out from under their bed every night. Okay? No. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. But I would say, do be f concerned if you are walking in reversionism and allowing yourself to be open to these things. That's when you should be concerned. But then what do you do? Rebound and recover. Get back into the Word of God, filling of the Spirit, and have faith and trust in God. And claim the promise. Because God did not give us a spirit of timidity. Again, we're not to be frightful, scared little people, but of power in love and of discipline. And again, discipline with the Word of God, having that resonant within your soul. And so ultimately, these uh, demonically influenced uh, individuals uh, who are operating, especially in the false way as we see it in our day and age, again, they're listening to the command of their king. Those who are demonically possessed are listening to the command of their king. And again, little K there being Satan, who's the ruler of the angelic, fallen angelic kingdom. And those who are demonically influenced, they too are allowing themselves to be led by the king of this world, Satan and his cosmic system. And we should not let their influence exer be exercised over us. And certainly the unsaved, they're kind of in that uh, mode already. Dangerous time for them. That's why you need to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. But remember, this is a warfare that will continue right up until the millennial reign and then right after the millennial reign for a little time as well. But then when we go on to the eterni eternity, all of this will end. And we'll be in heaven with God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and all other believers for all of eternity and all of sin and Satan and all these demonic influence will be put as aside, locked away in the eternal lake of fire. But until that day happens, we're in that warfare, we're in that struggle, we're in that battle. And the best thing you can do is to protect yourself through the intake and application of the Word of God and be filled with God the Holy Spirit. Remain that way. And you will be guided and protected each and every day. And if you're a good soiled individual, that soil inside of you that is taking in the word and ultimately applying it, you're not going to be influenced by Satan and his cosmic system. You're going to see the falsehood. You're going to see the lie. You're going to know true right from wrong. Otherwise, you know, our world today says wrong is right and right is wrong. OK, but you're going to see the truth and you're going to know the truth. And ultimately, you'll be able to apply that truth in your life. So ultimately, you walk forward in God's plan. All right, so uh, we'll close there and uh, uh, enter into our communion service here. So let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us the power and strength of the filling of your spirit, the filling of and indwelling of your son, Jesus Christ, and also your great plan for our life. We thank you for the power and strength of your word being resident within our soul. And Father, we know that it can be scary times out there in the world uh, from time to time and each and every day. 
But also we know, Father, that you are more powerful and more stronger than anything that Satan and his entire legions could throw at us. So, Father, we just ask that you lead us and guide us each and every day in confidence and in strength and in hope and in joy as we go forward in your plan, but also use us as servants to help others who may be demonically influenced within their lives so that you are glorified and they come to know your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask that you be with us in the closing portions of our service. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so uh, we're going to take communion, but if you like, let's go to John chapter 13. Let's go to John chapter 13. All right, and uh, George and uh, Joe, do you want to pass out the communion elements today? And the back back room has their things already, so you don't have to go back back there. Yep, <laughs> don't have to take life in your hands. <laughs> all right, all right. So uh, uh, no no song, song. Okay, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> you can just get up when I uh, start communion with in the future. <laughs> I didn't make him. He just sat down on his own. He could have stood there. <laughs> All right, so uh, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, let's just uh, pray and uh, praise for that. And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in uh, humble nature uh, and also in uh, great love and in great thanksgiving for what you and your Son, Jesus Christ, have done for us on the cross. We thank you for our personal salvation and uh, uh, the knowledge of life that we have, life eternal with you. We just thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for all that he has done for us. And we ask that this time be a solemn time of remembrance and thanksgiving and joy for what he has done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Waking up to a new sunrise Looking back from the other side I can see now with open eyes Darkest water and deepest pain I wouldn't trade it for anything Cause my brokenness brought me to you And these wounds are a story you'll use So I'm thankful for the scars Cause without them I wouldn't know your heart And I know they'll tell who you are So forever I'm thankful for the scars Now I'm standing in confidence With the strength of your faithfulness And I'm not who I was before No, I don't have to fear anymore So I'm thankful for all the scars cause without them I wouldn't know your heart and I know they'll tell who you are so I'm thankful for the scars I 
can see, I can see how you delivered me in your hands, in your feet. I found my victory. I can see, I can see how you delivered me in your hands, in your feet. I found my victory. I'm thankful for your scars, cause without them I wouldn't know your heart. And with my life I'll tell of who you are. So forever I am thankful. I'm thankful for the scars. Cause without them I wouldn't know your heart And I know they'll always tell of who you are So forever I am thankful for the scars I'm thankful for the scars All right, thank you, John and Emily. Beautiful song, as always, and uh, thank you for passing out the communion elements as well. Uh, so I have you uh, now in John chapter 13, uh, verse 21 through 35, because here we see another uh, form of de demonic possession, and this time it's by Satan himself. And I just wanted to share that with you since it's the topic of study, and we see that because it's happening at the communion table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he was passing out the bread and the wine and giving his disciples that great solemn uh, uh, ritual that we should be enacting of the communion supper, which we're doing today, ultimately Satan was there betraying Jesus Christ, but also Judas Iscariot allowing himself to uh, have Satan possess him, which means he was an unbeliever, and influencing him then to go and betray Jesus Christ to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and have Jesus arrested. So in verse 21 it says, and remember this is right after the great uh, storyline of the washing of the feet where talking about Jesus' work on the cross not only for salvation but for uh, our experiential sanctification, the confession of sin. Verse 21 says, when Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit. And testified and said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' breast one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, not being John himself. Simon Peter therefore gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom or tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back on Jesus' breast, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. And when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And after the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus therefore said to him, What you do, do quickly. Who is he talking to now, Satan, or is he talking to Judas Iscariot? So, but again, just think about that a little bit. Here he is giving this great, solemn you know, communion supper celebration and ultimately knowing that this individual was about to betray him, but Satan would also be possessing this individual. And when Satan possessed the individual, he said to Satan, what do you do? Do quickly. Go out and do it quickly. Jesus Christ, yeah, he was a little bit grieved because you're seeing a close friend that had been with you come to the final conclusion of his spiritual state of being an unbeliever, having Satan then possessing him, how sad that must have been. But at the same time, Jesus also knowing that he was about to face that torment of going to the cross. So we see all of this happening in the mind of Jesus Christ at this point in time, but yet not being afraid of Satan. Now Satan sitting right next to him. Was Jesus afraid of this individual? No, he wasn't. He said, if you're going to do it, go and do it quickly. 
You know, just let's get this over with, okay? Let's just do it, and then we'll move on from here, okay? But Jesus Christ knew absolutely what the result would be of him going to the cross. Whether Satan did or not uh, is yet r- remains to be seen. But basically, uh, Jesus Christ being confident in who he was, what he had to do, God's plan, having faith in the word of God in his soul, he was ready to go forward. Now in verse 28, now uh, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we need, have need of for the feast or else that he should give something to the poor. And so after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately and it was night. And then, therefore, you know the rest of the story and the trials and tribulations that Jesus Christ went through. But the greatest trial and tribulation was him paying for our sins upon the cross. The last three hours that he hung upon that cross where every sin of every member of the human race was put into the soul of Jesus Christ. And I'd say the uh, angelic race as well, if you look at Colossians 1.20, every sin that they would commit to was put into the body of Jesus Christ, and he paid for that sin. He died spiritually, suffered spiritually by being separated from God. My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Suffering greatly during that time period, but yet on the backside coming out victorious because our sins had been paid for once and for all. He who had no sin became sin on our behalf. And as a result of that, every one of us has the opportunity for eternal life. And you and I who have received that eternal life uh, are grateful for that eternal life. We're grateful for the blessings and benefits that we have available to us as a result. One of them being no longer potential for demon possession. So therefore, we go forward in the plan of God. We thank God for our salvation. We thank God for our eternal life. And in that, Jesus Christ took the bread and said, This is the body that I have, which is given for you. Eat this bread in remembrance of me. And we eat it in thanksgiving for the body that Jesus sacrificed on our behalf. And then in the same way, Jesus Christ took the cup, again, which is uh, the covenant that is found in his blood. And not through his literal blood, but the spiritual death that he uh, sacrificed on the cross. So it was demonstrated by the blood of the goats and calves and oxen that the Israelites had been slaughtering for uh, decades or or, uh, a millennia now. But yet his spiritual death that died for our sins, where he paid for the penalty of our sins, that is represented in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what this cup gives us remembrance of his spiritual sacrifice and we give thanksgiving that he paid for our sins so we could go free and thanksgiving let us drink with our heads bowed and our eyes closed father we thank you for this time of remembrance and we thank you for your son jesus christ for all that he has done for us and all that he continues to do for us and we can't thank you enough father for your great plan of salvation and the blessings in store for us not only in time but in the future eternity as well. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you. If you'd like to pass your cups down to the aisle, they'll be collected. And now we'll uh, have uh, Deacon Barry come forward and uh, we'll partake of our offering. Uh, I'd just like to uh, first reiterate uh, Jim's thoughts earlier on uh, such a a gracious congregation that we have that uh, everyone answered the bell um, and does uh, importantly really put us on track to uh, pay the rent at the first of the month when we're supposed to. So um, thank you all for that graciousness. So let us pray for the offering. Dear God, we thank you for the blessings of this congregation, for the graciousness reflected through our congregation from your power and spirit. We ask that you bless all that we're able to give. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.